after planing the segmented border down to be uh, flush with the veneer top, uh, as is often the case, uh, plain blade uh, iron causes a little bit of tear out in the wood where the grain uh, changes direction. And uh, so in this case, the way I'm going to uh, remove those tear out marks is using a card scraper. This is a uh, piece of, of thin steel. I uh, flattened the edge and then using a burnisher, which is really just a steel rod, I've actually pushed over the edge slightly to give a burr. What you do is you run the rod down the edge, pushing hard. Of course, this is in a vise, pushing hard down, and it causes a burr to form. And the burr is sharp. And, uh, what you do is take the card scraper and you just flex it a little bit with your thumbs to make a, a point that contacts the wood so you can control exactly where the contact is. And I'm just taking very light cuts and I'm getting a little bit of, 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 of uh, shaving. You can push harder and get actual shavings, very controllable, and you can just fare the damage section in and remove all those marks and get a perfect surface. I always like to, if possible, put my brand on my work in some inconspicuous place and I'm going to do that here on the bottom of the tabletop right in the center. Uh, if you're really interested, get down your hands and knees. You can see it otherwise it's not really you know, in your face. I had this brand made. It's the kind you heat up with a torch. It's, it's simply my logo, the same logo you saw at the beginning of the video. You heat it up with a torch. Now this is the only time I ever allow an open flame in the workshop when I'm heating up this brand. You notice I've got a fire extinguisher nearby. Any, you know, I keep the rags and everything all away from this uh, just to be on the safe side. Now, you have to heat this until it changes color. It'll take a minute. And I go ahead and rotate it through the flame to keep the heating evenly. And after a while, you'll see it'll start to change color. starting to get a little bit of a bronzy, coppery look. I'll see some blues here in a minute. And that tells me we're getting close. And I've got a piece of scrap wood here that I'll practice the brand on to make sure that I got the heat right. You don't want it too hot or it will burn through the wood. So if I get it too hot, I'll know it when I do my practice. Okay now. There we are. That's it. Now I'll be sanding through that to get, you know, the burn that goes a little bit outside of the logo and it'll look really nice. It's right in the center. And now uh, I want to keep my iron somewhere where it can cool. So I'm going to put it in a vise on the handle so it's sticking up and let it cool. I'm going to do the same thing with the regulator and tip on the torch uh, until they cool. The pedestal portion of this table is made of three, uh, or excuse me, four upright pieces of uh, one inch thick maple. This comes from the same tree that my, uh, my client uh, uh, had me use for a desk and a mantle that I made. You may have seen those previous videos. Same client, same tree. We're trying to uh, use uh, some of this solid maple for these uprights which uh, have a, a curve in them. And so uh, I've taken a single plank that's 10 feet long and cut it into four pieces and that way all four of these pieces of wood will have the same grain characteristics and coloration. And now I'm making a, a template 
that I can draw this curve on each piece, get them the same before I bandsaw them. So I've uh, taken a piece of eighth inch uh, plywood and squared it up and cut it to the right length for the template. And then I mark the end center and other end points of where the curve has to flow. To draw the curve, I'm using a, a, a drawing bow. Um, this is uh, one that's commercially available from Lee Valley. It's uh, fiberglass, has a uh, adjustable strap. You can adjust the strap and make the curve uh, you know, tighter or looser. They also have asymmetric bows where the material is thicker at one end than the other and so it bends in an asymmetric way. This curve is fairly symmetric, so I'm using a symmetric bow. You can also make these yourself out of uh, a good, consistent piece of material. Now, all I do is, uh, I've already adjusted this to save some time, and I just, adjust, I just uh, line it up on the marks, uh, roughly, where I want them. And uh, once I have it about where I like it, I'm just going to go ahead and trace the curve. Okay, so I have a fairly decent tracing now. I can go over to the band saw, cut that, and then I can transfer this to all the other pieces and make them all the same. Bandsaw the shape. Uh, now I'm going to clean up the bandsaw blade marks uh, using spoke shaves. I've got both a flat spoke shave, which seems to work well, and a curved spoke shave if I get into any really tight, tight places. mock-up of how this is going to look. Basically, these pieces are just laying there in place. They're, they're not connected, so I've got to be careful. I don't breathe too hard. But um, the plan is to make a dowel jig so I can put three dowels in the bottom and top of each of these uprights. So that would make a total of 12 dowels holding to the base, 12 dowels holding to the top. And I've got thick enough material. I probably use uh, two inch dowels with no problem, uh, three eighths diameter, good holding power. So uh, just wanted to make sure the lineup looked right and I've got some green tape down there so I remember how I've got the lineup done and I'll, uh, now I'm going to make a jig and do the doweling. Now in order to get this drill guide to work properly, I've drilled two countersunk holes that I can put uh, long drywall screws into to hold this down firmly to the surface and then I can use these holes as my guide for my 3 8 inch drill to get nice perpendicular holes in the right position. I've also marked uh, each of the quadrants with a letter A, B, C, and D. Uh, I guess it's A, B, C, and D and then I've marked the ends of these boards so that I have the orientation correct uh, with respect uh, to, to the platform just in case the holes are maybe a little bit off and also uh, I've marked which side of this drill guide is supposed to face uh, you know the, the work so the bottom of the drill guide says platform so it faces the platform. The top here says toward legs, and so it faces the legs. I'll also use this um, to do the underside of the table, and so I've written on this side toward the top underside, and on the bottom it says toward the legs. And I've taken a small marking punch. I've lined up the center of my guide with center marks on, on the platform here. 
Now I'll just take my marking punch and make a little indention that will then be where I'll drill the holes for the uh, for the for the sheetrock screws and then I'll screw this into place and then I can drill and I'll know my holes will be perfectly spaced. I've marked my pilot drill to to a depth so I don't exceed. Okay, now I'm in position, I can go ahead and drill my 3 8 inch holes. I put a stop collar on the drill bit so I can't go too deep. I don't want to go through the material. This is how I'm going to bore the holes in the, uh, the pedestal legs. I've uh, I've marked with a center punch where the holes are using the, the, the guide you know, template that, that I would made. And now I've set up a shop smith. Um, this is an old like 1950 version uh, Model 10 ER, one of the old cast iron jobs used to belong to my father. And I use it for things like horizontal boring. So I've set it up with the table horizontal so it's parallel with the, with the bit. And using uh, the miter gauge with a clamp block, I'm able to uh, to uh, you know align the the work so that the tip of the brad point drill uh, lines up with the indentation from the center punch. And then I clamp the work to the table so it won't slide. I set my depth to give me about an inch and a quarter total travel, and uh, that'll give me a hole deep enough for the dowel. And then I just go ahead. And Slowly drill the hole, and this will give me a very accurate, very repeatable boring that I can uh, do on all the pieces in order. Just undo my clamp, flip the work over, make sure all the chips are gone, line up the edge of my work with the I've made this uh, based on lining up with the edge of the miter gauge slot. That gives me the same depth with every piece. Clamp down. Go ahead and do the next hole. I've sanded the base here down to 320 grit sandpaper. I'm going to be using water soluble aniline dyes both on the walnut and the maple and they're going to raise the grain. They're going to cause the wood to absorb some water, swell, and when the water dries, the wood stays in that swelled uh, condition, which uh, leaves a rough surface. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and spray some water on the surface and get that process to happen right now, and then I'll come back and I'll sand off the grain. That's called raising the grain. I'll sand off the grain, and then it'll be smooth, and when I put the water-based dye on, the amount of absorption swelling will be much, much less. You just want to put on about as much water as you think you're going to be putting on with the dye. I'll just soak in a little bit. Let get all the edges. I'll just kind of lightly wipe off the excess so I can flip this over and do the other side. And then we'll let it dry. Now the technique with the top is going to be a little different than the base. I don't want to raise the grain on the curly 
uh, maple, the fiddleback maple, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not going to get stained with water-based stain. It's going to be shellac, and shellac doesn't really raise grain much. Uh, the other thing is, I've already, uh, as you as you well know, I've already softened this. It's been put in water a bunch of times and sanded down, and so uh, the grain is pretty stable on that. So what I want to do is I want to seal this uh, maple in a little bit so that when I stain the walnut, the walnut stain doesn't absorb into the maple. And so I'm going to take a little shellac here. I've got some uh, some orange shellac mixed up. Orange will give the, the piece a little bit of the amber tone that I want to get. And I'm just going to go very carefully apply the shellac just to the just to the maple. And we'll just seal that and we'll do a couple coats. Dyeing the wood is a kind of a meticulous operation. I use a foam applicator and you have to just get right up to the edge. You don't want to dye the maple, just the walnut with this walnut mix. It's an aniline dye mixture of some extra dark, well actually deep mission brown with a little touch of, uh, of yellow in it. Just the right color. One of the problems with aniline dye is that um, the, the effect can vary uh, from piece of wood to piece of wood because the dye is so transparent and the color is a combination of the dye and the underlying wood. Even wood from the same log uh, can have varying looks. Um, so you've got to, you know, with the same dye, so you've got to have some way to be able to correct that. And what I've discovered here is uh, that the aniline dyes dissolve in uh, shellac, which is basically denatured alcohol, and I can do what's called glazing. After I have established the color of the finish using uh, shellac, uh, I can then go back and put a layer of shellac that is slightly tinted and adjust the color. And that's what we'll do right now. I've mixed up a little bit of uh, blonde shellac with some uh, a dark red mahogany, uh, just a dash of dark red mahogany and a dash of yellow. And uh, that'll take this uh, greenish tinge that I seem to have on the finished piece and give it a little bit of red. Uh, I'm using just a little uh, cotton applicator. Mix just a little bit, and just go apply it. And you can see immediately that the, the reds and the browns are helping to mute that greenish cast. Well, the finishing of the base and the legs is complete, and so I'm now gluing the legs on. I've decided to glue the legs on one at a time so I can check the trueness of the squareness to, uh, to the leg. And uh, frankly, because of the size of this piece, I've had to come up with a rather, rather elaborate clamping scheme where I use a beam with a clamp on the back side of my bench and on the front side of my bench to bring this on down so I get a good tight joint. I'm using three two-inch dowels into the, uh, into the base and up into the leg. I'll do the same thing at the top. I'll just glue these legs on one at a time and, uh, and then I'll glue the top on. This is how I've glued the base to the top. The top's upside down, obviously, and we've got the three dowels per, uh, per leg. And I've used a big 4x4 uh, four four oak beam that I had to, uh, using the auxiliary table, clamp either side so I can pull this down. I mean, it's such an unwieldy piece. And I've gotten good contact here, and so 
uh, we're going to be in good shape with that set. And, uh, and then next, we'll go ahead and flip it over and do the finish on the top. I've got the co uh, color of the table about what I want, uh, you know, using the amber, uh, or excuse me, the orange uh, shellac and doing some sanding and so forth. And now I'm ready to uh, apply the finish. It's 50% uh, polyurethane varnish and mineral spirits. And I simply put a small amount on my fingers and just rub it in. I don't want to get too much because I'm not going to actually let this set up. I'm going to let it uh, sit on the surface for for a while until it gets to the point where I can just rub off the excess and have a smooth finish. At that point there will be a little bit of finish left on the table but it won't be tacky, it won't pick up dust, and that makes it so I can end up with a dust-free surface that doesn't have to be sanded. Of course, you know, sanding always means potential of sanding through the veneer and the color and so forth. I just don't want to do that, but I do want to have some protection of polyurethane varnish. And I'll be doing this a number of times, so it's a very slow buildup. It takes several days to get through the process, most of the time just sitting here curing. Of course, varnishes cure differently than shellac. Shellac simply cures by the evaporation of the solvent, which is denatured alcohol. In varnish, the curing is actually a cross-linking of the molecules when exposed to oxygen and you can't dissolve the varnish finish. It's on there for good. The only way to remove it is either mechanically or chemically with you know strippers. Mechanically meaning sanding. And that's what makes varnish such a durable finish. Okay, I'm getting to the point now where I can feel the, the finish beginning to uh, set up and dry. So I take a cloth and just wipe off the excess. There we go. Very, very thin uh, amount of uh, varnish on there, and we're going to do this a number of times to uh, allow it to set up to, uh, a, you know, protective finish. It'll never, it'll never look thick, but it will be protective. Now I've put on a lot of coats of my thinned out polyurethane varnish, thin 50/50 with mineral spirits. I got about the right sheen. Now I'm going to finish up by putting a little varnish on and then also using a mixture of varnish, tongue oil, and boiled linseed oil. This will be my final couple of coats. Maybe I might even finish up with a little beeswax and oil. We'll see. This will give the, the finish just a little nicer feel. Just rub this in. This will take a little longer to set up because it's got oil in it. Oil doesn't set up quite as quickly as varnish. And by the way, before I before I put this on, I sanded it lightly with 600 grit sandpaper to give a little tooth and to you know, smooth out any little rough spots. We'll let that sit for a little while and then uh, wipe it dry and allow it to cure.